Oh my God, again? And when will they get quiet? Mrs. Langham sighed, waking up. She had always had little sleep, and for the past month, she had almost been deprived of even the small amount of sleep she used to have. All this was because of her new neighbour. No sooner had he moved in than the noise started. Every night there was music and screaming, and now he started coming to her property. Why would he do that? She didn't have a garden. There was nothing to steal from her, but her new neighbour kept breaking in. Mrs. Langham turned on the light to let them know she was awake. Maybe that would quiet them down. Although, why should they stop? He knew, scoundrel, that there was only an elderly woman living in the house. What can she do except shout at him in a stern voice? Maybe she should change her residence, but she loved this little house so much. The only valuable thing that her son left to her. He saved money, which he earned through hard work at the construction site, and bought her this house. Before that, they lived together in a two-room apartment in a not very comfortable neighbourhood on the fifth floor without an elevator. So, Bill thought of buying her a house. He knew that his mother always wanted to live closer to nature to grow flowers, maybe some greenery and berries, and he chose a beautiful cosy house in a large, well-maintained village of urban type. It was a quiet, peaceful place. Her neighbours were all great people. The house was small but cosy. In one word, there was everything for a happy and joyful life. Unfortunately, that joy disappeared from Mrs. Langham's life, together with Bill, her only son. It was a car accident on a slippery road. Bill, Bill, the driver of the cab that took him and the perpetrator of the accident, died in that horrible accident. Eight years have passed since then. Mrs. Langham was happy in the new house for six months only, and then there was no time for joy. Now she got used to living with her misfortune, quietly and privately. But a month ago, her solitude ended. Her neighbours, a very elderly couple, died one after another. Their children did not want to live in the country. It's not the young people's style. They had work and business in the city, so they sold their parents' house. But the new owners didn't live there. They just rented it out to a young guy. Or maybe it was their relative. Nobody ever figured it out. And so the young man started living life to the fullest. And to poison the lives of everyone around him, first of all to Mrs. Langham, his nearest neighbour. At first he seemed like a decent guy. He visited Mrs. Langham. Hello, I'm Roger, your new neighbour. At that very first time, Mrs. Langham noticed that he didn't look at her. He was looking around the yard with his eyes, almost sniffing everything. Oh, what a beautiful flower bed you have. Would you mind giving me some flowers to sprout? It was clear to Mrs. Langham that he was not a gardener at all, but it seemed uncomfortable to push him away, so she talked to him nicely, introduced herself and promised to help. Meanwhile, he was so polite and obliging. By the way, if you need help, feel free to contact me. Maybe you need something dug or repaired. I'm always happy to help. But it did not hide from Mrs. Langham that at these words, the neighbor's eyes ran strangely like the eyes of a thief at the fair. God forbid such helpers, Mrs. Langham immediately thought to herself. And then problems began, from which she didn't know how to save herself. She could even get used to the rumbling and noise that was constantly coming from his plot. But why did he keep prowling around her property with his guests or friends? Did he really think that after a simple acquaintance, he was his own man in her house and yard? It would be fine if he just came by to say hello and chat a little, but no, he hung around the garden without her permission. He trampled her flowers. Moreover, one day she caught him digging near the foundation of her house. What was he looking for? Mrs. Langham asked him every time what he was doing on her property and got all sorts of excuses. You know, I just came in because your flower bed is overgrown with weeds. I got it weeded a little, and now it looks just perfect. Or 
Another answer was, Dear Mrs. Langham, I'm just checking the foundation of your house to see if it's good. Mine has started to deteriorate a little bit, and there's no one to help you, so I thought I'd do it as a neighbour. You know, after your corrections, I don't want the house to collapse. And I don't want you touching my flower beds any more. I'm sorry, but you didn't pull weeds, you pulled flowers. I'm sorry, but I wanted to help, and you... Roger always answered, as if he were upset to the core. Mrs. Langham had already tried in every possible way to establish relations with him. She knew how to communicate with young people, because she had been a teacher for many years. But in the case of Roger, all words were in vain. Oh, if Billy were alive, he'd quickly put things in order. And if I had known that he would be gone, I would never have gone to live here in this village. I would have stayed in the city. Back then, when her son only started talking about buying a house, Mrs. Langham tried to talk him out of it. Sonny, it's not a good idea. The house costs a lot of money. And by the way, I have a place to live. Of course you have a place, but it's absolutely not something you can dream of. What kind of apartment is this? Think about it. Aren't you tired of climbing up to the fifth floor several times a day? Imagine what it would be like in the country. Open the door, get out and walk at your leisure, not along the apartment building, but in your own backyard. Clean, beautiful, with flowers everywhere and a green hedge. Mum, isn't that heaven on earth? Bill described it so well that Mrs. Langham herself caught fire with the idea. Indeed, why not live in her own house? And when Bill showed her a picture of the house, she could not refuse. Though, of course, she resisted until the end. Oh, Billy, you should not buy this house. You should think about yourself. It's time you got married and had children of your own. What are you dragging on? Please tell me. I'm not dragging on anything. I'll get it done, don't worry. Everything has time. I'll do it, but a little later, and we'll visit you on vacation and send your grandchildren on vacations. You'll be sorry you asked me to, laughed Bill. But when? It's better to be a young father, think about it. Was it easy for us to be late parents? You'd have been better off if your father and I were younger. And by the way, it's easier to be a young grandmother, too. You better not say such words, replied Bill sternly. For me, you're the best parents in the world, and I'm sure you'll be the best grandmother. Yes, Bill was a late child. Mrs. Langham and her husband were already in their forties when he was born. They say late children are early orphans. Happy are those parents who go away before their children. Mrs. Langham's husband was lucky. A heart attack took him a few years ago before the death of their son. He didn't learn about this grief or learn it afterwards. Having met him where, as they say, everyone meets. And now those darned neighbours had to wake her up, as if on purpose, so that she should stay awake and torture herself with these sad thoughts again. Mrs. Langham got up, got dressed and went to the kitchen. She had to make herself something for breakfast. Actually, she intended to get up early anyway, but not at four in the morning. But okay, by the time she's ready, dressed and cleaned up, it'll be time. She was going to visit her son's grave today, the anniversary of his death. Before leaving the house, Mrs. Langham checked to make sure she had everything, a broom, a rake, watering can, rags and candy. Well, everything seemed to be with her. The elderly woman didn't go to the bus stop but decided to walk. It's only three kilometres. She won't get tired. The weather was good. It was the Indian autumn. A walk in the morning coolness was nice. What was the point of jostling in the bus? The cemetery was almost empty. The elderly woman went to the grave and ran her hand over the cold gravestone. Hello, Sonny. Here I am again. Ninth year without you. She looked around. There was nothing to clean up, but for the sake of order, she wiped the monument, plucked some blades of grass, swept the fallen leaves, and wiped the bench. 
She sat down to talk to her son. She was used to telling him everything. Yes, Billy, that's how I live alone. I've gotten used to it, and everything would be fine except there's this new neighbor. The elderly mother told him all about her sorrows and the intrigues of the new neighbor, but finally it was time to say goodbye. Forgive me, my son, for complaining, but who else can I tell about my troubles? You are my hope and my support. Only you can't stand up for me now. But the fact that I had you as a good son makes me feel better. I'm going home. Don't miss me. I love you. Mrs. Langham touched the gravestone as a farewell and left the cemetery. Again, she decided to walk, hoping to get tired and fall asleep quickly. The road went through the centre of the village. She decided to go to the supermarket to buy some groceries, so that she wouldn't have to walk later. In her part of the village, the grocery store was small, and there was nothing to buy but bread. When Mrs. Langham came to the supermarket, she stopped in surprise. At the entrance, there was a girl about seven years old, with a cardboard box in her hands. She was obviously collecting money. A beggar child in their village? It simply couldn't have been. In the big city, Mrs. Langham saw children and adults begging for alms, but never in the village. The elderly woman came closer and read the inscription on the box. For the operation of my mum, help, please. The girl looked pretty decent. She was clean, though not richly dressed, groomed and clearly uncomfortable asking for help. The girl was shy, standing without raising her eyes. "'What's the matter with your mother?' Mrs. Langham couldn't help but ask as she walked up to the little girl. "'I don't know. She has some kind of serious illness. The doctor said she needs an operation, but we don't have the money.' The sad voice of that little girl made Mrs. Langham's heart sink. Do you have any relatives? she asked. We don't have any, and I don't have a daddy, sighed the girl as she raised her big blue eyes to the elderly woman. There was such great sorrow in them. Mrs. Langham had seen such an expression only in the mirror after she had lost her only son. The woman took all the cash out of her purse and put it in a box with only a few coins in it. Thank you the girl said, and her face lit up with a shy smile. Suddenly, Mrs. Langham froze, because she saw an unusual hairpin in the little girl's hair. Did she know this thing? You bet. Such hairpins had been used by her grandmother, then by her mother. Then it was passed down to Mrs. Langham herself, a family antique, perhaps of no material value, but dear as a memory. Mrs. Langham's mother gave it to her, but she cut off her skinny braid when she was a child. Since then, Mrs. Langham's had a short haircut. Once, Bill saw it on his mother's dressing table and asked, And why do you need that hairpin? You don't use it. It's not just a hairpin, answered Mrs. Langham with a slight offence. It's an old thing which belonged to my grandmother. My mum wore it, but I don't have braids or daughters. Take it for yourself and give it to your sweetheart when you have one. Maybe you'll have a daughter later, and it won't go to waste. Bill took it, but had he given it to anyone? After all, he wasn't married. Nevertheless, Mrs. Langham never saw her hairpin again after his death. Girl, where did you get this thing? Mrs. Langham asked, touching the jewelry. It's a very beautiful and unusual hairpin. My mother gave it to me. She said it was an antique. I see. Could you introduce me to your mum? Maybe I can help her in some way, Mrs. Langham asked, curious as to where that woman had gotten one-of-a-kind hairpin. Really? Can you? The blue eyes lit up with hope, and they made Mrs. Langham uncomfortable. Could she really help this girl and her seriously ill mother? Of course not. She just wanted to know about the hairpin and how this strange woman was related to her dead son. Although, who knows, maybe there's something she can do for them. Even if the woman just found a hairpin on the street and never met Bill. I don't know, sweetie, but I'd really like to help, 
and maybe your mum and I can figure out some way. Mummy's always at home, she never comes out. If you want to meet her, come to our house. We don't live very far away. It wasn't a very long way for the quick little feet. Mrs. Langham, who was used to long walks, and had already travelled a long way in the morning, found it more difficult. She was tired and out of breath. But on the way, she learned that the little girl's name was Katie, and her mother's name was Amanda. They lived together, and the girl did not know her father, nor did she know any other relatives. And one day the girl came up with the idea of asking for alms for treatment. Her mother didn't even know about it. "'Don't tell my mum, please. Pretend we just met at the supermarket,' the girl pleaded. "'I know it's wrong to lie, but I want to help. I'm so afraid of being taken away from my mum to the orphanage.' "'When you leave home, what do you tell her?' Mrs. Langham asked. Well, I lie a little bit. I tell her I have extra classes at school, and when my mum gets better, I'll tell her everything. Honestly, I never lie at all. I didn't lie before, and I won't lie again. While they talked, they arrived at a cottage, located in the poorest area of the village. Entering the shabby old house, Mrs. Langham was not particularly surprised by the squalor of the furnishings and the blatant poverty. How could a young woman with a child live like this? The explanation was simple. She was ill. When the elderly woman and the girl entered the room, the mother was lying on the bed. Only when she saw the guest did she try to get up. Mummy, this is Mrs. Langham. She wants to help us, the little girl explained. Pleased to meet you, the hostess smiled weakly. I am Amanda. Kate, go for a walk. I would like to speak with our guest. Suddenly, Mrs. Langham became numb when she saw a photograph of her son on the nightstand beside the woman's bed, with a black ribbon crossing the corner. Meanwhile, the girl obediently left the room, closing the door behind her, and Amanda motioned for the guest to sit on a stool and smiled pitifully. "'Are you from school? I don't know what you promised my daughter, but it's clear you didn't come to help. Do you want to take her away from me?' The woman's voice was tearful, but it was clear that she wouldn't resist. She just didn't have the strength for it. Or maybe she realised she had no strength to take care of the child. Mrs. Langham's heart shrank from this hopelessness and from the conjecture that came after what she had seen. No, I'm not from the school and I'm not from any juvenile organisation at all, she tried to reassure Amanda. I saw your daughter's hairpin and wondered where she took it from. And I'd also like to know where you got that picture from. Ah, this. The young woman took the picture and ran her fingers gently over the glass. This hairpin was given to me by him. He's Kate's father. We never had time to get married. We quarrelled over some trifle and never had time to reconcile. He died. I was in college and lived in a dormitory, and my parents lived in this house. They drank heavily and they also died. When Kate was born, I left to study and they evicted me from the dormitory. I came back here. I thought after my maternity leave I'd get a job and move to a better place. But unfortunately I got sick. At first not too badly, I was still working. And then, the young woman pointed to the bed, I became bedridden. But can't the doctors do anything? the elderly woman asked with despair. The doctors? Well, they say I need an operation, but they can only do it for a fee, and I don't even have money for tests. I can only afford the most necessary medicines. You know, you can hardly help me. I can, Mrs. Langham answered firmly. She could not explain how she gained such confidence, nor did she understand why she had not confessed to Amanda that the man in the picture was her son. She was going to say it, of course, but later. Firmly promising help to Amanda, she already considered her daughter-in-law. Mrs. Langham said goodbye to her warmly and went home. But on the way, her enthusiasm waned a little. She began to think about how she could help Amanda and Kate. The sum required was huge. She had never had such money before, and could never have had it. Maybe I should sell the house, why not? 
the nasty neighbour is genuinely interested in my plot of land, so maybe he would like to buy it. Perhaps he won't bargain, and if he doesn't give me a good price, I'll try to sell it to others. Okay, but then where will I live? I think Amanda and Kate will let me in. For Bill's sake, I have to do it. It's his daughter. I immediately felt as if the girl was not a stranger to me, thought the elderly woman, tiredly going home. She reached her house, entered her yard and gasped. The scoundrel neighbour taking advantage of the mistress's absence had heartily walked in her yard. There was garbage and empty bottles everywhere. The flower bed which Mrs. Langham had lovingly tended was all torn up. Oh no! The elderly woman almost tearfully exclaimed. Yes, that's the answer. He won't let me live here in peace any more. I'll have to sell it. But not to him. I'll sell it to other people. I'll sell it to a strong man, the kind that will put this scoundrel in their place. Having made that decision, Mrs. Langham went to the neighbour to ask him what was going on. Tell me, Roger, what do you need on my plot? Why are you digging there and constantly littering? She asked sternly. Hey, Granny, you've already pestered me with your accusing. Am I the only one who lives in the settlement? Who told you that I was digging in your yard? I have nothing to do with that. While you were walking around all day, anyone could have walked in here. Why are you bothering me with your complaints? I can see it's useless. I thought you had some conscience left, but you don't. So, I'll go to the police and report you. Mrs. Langham promised him sternly, but inside she wanted to cry. And she did go to the police station, but she realised that it would probably be of no use. First, the neighbour had not done any significant damage to her, and second, she had no evidence that he was making noise at night and climbing onto her property during the day. The fact that it never happened before he moved in was not an argument. What about putting video cameras to monitor and record? Unfortunately, she had no idea how to do that, and it's probably not cheap either, especially since now, on, she was going to save every penny. And the main thing was that even if she proved that Roger was messing around, so what? The policeman would talk to him, that's all, and the neighbour would do something worse the next day out of spite. Despite all this thinking, Mrs. Langham went to the police because she had no more strength to endure. Maybe he knew someone who could help her start the sale of the house. She wasn't alone in this, either. The police reacted as Mrs. Langham had feared. The elderly woman tried to approach them with determination and indignation. She knew her rights. The young officer on duty, who apparently remembered his school days yet, accepted to her mentor tone, got quiet, and did not tell Mrs. Langham that she had come with insignificant complaint. Instead, he directed her to a relevant police officer. Are you joking? We're dealing with serious matters here, and you're talking about some flowers and bottles. Mrs. Langham, maintaining her teacher tone, responded, all right, but if I climb into your plot now, trample everything and throw garbage on it, is that not serious business either? I'm talking about malicious hooliganism. About not giving me a peaceful life. Understand for you it's nothing, but what should I do? I can't fight with a young boy. The older policeman replied, Do you want me to come over there and rub his ears? Or maybe you want to have a guard posted at your house? By law, we can't even fine him because we have no proof. Okay, I'll come to him and say, why are you making noise? Why are you disturbing your elderly neighbour? And he will answer that it's you yourself who organised the disorder, and it will be just your word against his. Oh, it's even strange that I have to explain all this to you instead of dealing with serious crimes. However, Mrs Langham didn't give up and insisted... But what about my statement? Can I, an old woman, be ignored? No, I'll write a statement. You may not investigate it. Just write on it that you work only for young and healthy, useful members of the society. And I fulfilled my functions, and now I should live without police protection. And with this, I'll go to higher authorities. 
For God's sake, you can go even to the UN, said the policeman angrily. Just don't forget to enclose the statement of witnesses, which you don't have now. Nobody tells you to live without police protection, but do you know how many people like you come to us? This one's had his chicken stolen. That one's had his apple plucked. If we deal with these issues, who will fight the real criminals? Mrs. Langham realised that the conversation was turning into a scandal, but she didn't know what else to do. She felt powerless and didn't know how to reach the man who could help her. Should she leave? No way. If she left now, she wouldn't be able to solve her problem or help Amanda. She had to do something. Therefore, she took a piece of paper and began to write a statement. Suddenly, the door opened abruptly and someone entered the office, asking in a commanding tone, Igor, how long will I have to wait for a document on the McCaffreys? I'm sorry, Mr. Halston, but I have here the crime of the century. Someone has trampled the flowers in this elderly woman's yard, replied the investigator venomously. Mrs. Langham turned around and recognised the entrant. In a stern teacher's tone, she said, smiling, You, Charles Halston, must knock and ask permission if you interrupt the conversation between two people. She was surprised by how easily the words came out. Charles was also surprised and confused. Nice to see you, Mrs. Langham. I'm sorry I didn't recognise you at first. No wonder your subordinates talk to people so impolitely, said Mrs. Langham. Fortunately for the elderly woman, the chief of the police station was her former student, Charles Halston. He got into her class as a ten-year-old boy and by that age was considered a hooligan and a complete loser. His previous teacher wouldn't do anything about him. She thought that he was retarded. She was ready to send him to a special school for such kids, and she would have sent him if his parents hadn't stood up for their own son. However, he would hardly have been able to finish his studies if he hadn't gotten into Mrs. Langham's class. She immediately realised that Charles was not mentally disabled at all, and the main problem was an attention deficit. His parents thought that if he was well-fed and dressed appropriately for the season, everything was fine. Charles's first teacher, having failed to explain even the simplest task in the first grade, simply gave up. But meanwhile, Charles needed adult attention and approval, not constant reproach. He needed an individualised approach to let him discover his talents. No one requested that Mrs. Langham tutor Charles, and at first he resisted her extra attention. Why should I stay after school again? Well, Mrs. Langham, give me a C. That's all I need and deserve. You've been told that I'm incapable, I have a bad memory, and I should go to school stupid, he whined when Mrs. Langham left for extra classes. Charles, I don't care what other people say. I see that you are much more capable than many people, and you can get A's, and I will prove it to you, to everyone, the teacher said. The first successes made Charles believe in his own strength. Soon he went as an excellent student, and no longer needed any additional lessons. He considered Mrs. Langham to be his greatest good fortune. After all, he graduated from school with honours and entered law school. Mrs. Langham often remembered him, but he apparently forgot about her while studying in the capital. Mrs. Langham did not feel resentment, and did not expect gratitude for her labour, believing that she simply did her job decently. Of course, Charles did not forget his favourite teacher, but when he was appointed head of the local police, he hadn't realised that she lived in one of the nearest villages, and now he found out, though not for the most cheerful reason. Charles took her to his office, questioned her about all the circumstances of the case she had applied for, wrote down the neighbour's address and details, and reassured her that they would deal with the case. He promised his teacher that he would find out what kind of person her neighbour was, and that she should not say anything to him yet. Oh, Charles, you'll save me if you can somehow manage to rein him in, 
rejoiced Mrs. Langham. But this is not my only problem. I'm thinking of selling the house, although it's a long story. Let's talk about it later, she ventured to say, revealing one more difficulty. Is it really the neighbours cause you're moving? It's not worth it, honestly. Soon he will be afraid to sneeze in front of you, I promise, Charles reassured. No, a different matter. I'll tell you later, sometime. I shouldn't take out all of my problems on you at once. Yes, it's a busy time right now, but we'll discuss all your difficulties and see how this can be solved. And yes, I really don't like your neighbour. I don't like him very much, too. Mrs. Langham went home and calmed down. Roger was once again fidgeting around her gate, but he did not go into the yard. Well, Granny, have you complained? He asked cheerfully, rather than fearfully or warily. I did. They promised to slap your hands so that you wouldn't touch anything in my yard, said Mrs. Langham, without much anger. She was confident that her neighbour would soon be dealt with. The police would find a way to subdue him. However, she had to wait for a whole week, and Roger was not appeased in the slightest. Nightly concerts and raids on her territory continued. The elderly teacher was ready to believe that Charles had forgotten about her, and therefore she herself would have to attend to her own issues, including the sale of the house. Mrs. Langham didn't forget that her son's beloved was waiting to be saved at the other end of the village. The elderly woman even started to inquire if anyone wanted to buy her house and how much it would cost. The information was disappointing. There were no buyers, and the price was half of what was needed to cure Amanda. One of her friends noticed her distress and said, "'What have you waited for, Mrs. Langham? Our village is good, but who wants to live outside the city nowadays? Only old people. And what money do they have? I thought of selling last year, but no one gave me more than the amount I was asking. And, by the way, I've got a bigger house and a bigger garden. By the way, why are you suddenly thinking of selling? Where are you going to live? But Mrs. Langham was so saddened by what she had heard that she only waved her hand. After all, selling the house was her only hope. And if the money was not enough, what was the point of selling? Sure, they could buy some more medicine and eat better, but the three of them will have to live in a horrible cramped house and they'd run out of money fast. Maybe she should take Kate and Amanda back to her place. Maybe Amanda's state of mind would be better here, though with such a neighbour it is doubtful. Exhausted by such thoughts, Mrs. Langham had lost faith in justice and the successful resolution of problems, and stopped going out of the house so as not to meet with the neighbour and not to hear unnecessary insults. However, she understood that her daughter-in-law and granddaughter were waiting for her. Therefore, one day, Mrs. Langham decided to go to them and confess that she had no money. Even the sale of her house would not change the situation. She had already dressed, looked out the window and saw a police car pull up at her home. Charles came out of it, accompanied by several other policemen, in whose hands were strange devices, whose purpose Mrs. Langham did not understand at first. At first, it seemed to her that they were some kind of vertical vacuum cleaners or something, but then she realised that they were more serious devices. She went out on the porch to greet the guests and ask what they were going to do, but it didn't look like they were going to talk much. They just said hello in a business-like manner and got down to business. By this time, Mrs. Langham had already realised that these tools were metal detectors and was frightened. Were they really going to look for something dangerous in her yard? Charles, what's going on? She asked quietly, approaching her former student. Is there something dangerous here? Don't worry, you are in no danger, he replied. We'll find out everything soon. Meanwhile, his companions carefully examined Mrs. Langham's plot, meter by meter. At last, one of them said softly, There's something. A chill crawled down the elderly woman's back. What had they found there? 
Did Roger have a terrible time burying something? Oh, Charles, what is it? she asked pitifully. Well, Mrs. Langham, I never thought you were such a little coward. Charles smiled encouragingly at her. Meanwhile, his subordinates took out small shovels from the car and began to dig the ground skillfully. They're going to dig holes. I'm really getting angry. Mrs. Langham's fright was replaced by annoyance. One is hiding, others are looking for it and digging. And then I'll have to put everything in order. The digging was not very deep, less than a metre. Soon the policeman pulled out of the ground a small but strong, heavy metal box. Something like a cabinet safe. Charles winked at his teacher. Well, shall we perform the opening of the magic box now? He picked up a tool and soon deftly opened the box. Those who looked inside whistled. There were bundles of money, carefully packed in plastic wrap, and a bag of gold and silver jewellery. Mrs. Langham, who had expected a moment of relief that nothing terrible had happened, was surprised. And what is it? What does it all mean? It's a hiding place. Your house used to belong to a criminal mastermind who was arrested and sentenced to 25 years. He must have kept a stash for when he got out. The house was confiscated and put up for sale, and nobody knew about the treasure. But your neighbour must have found out, so that's why he's been raiding your garden. How did he find out, and why only now? Mrs. Langham couldn't understand. This criminal boss was his father. When the man was imprisoned, Roger was twelve years old. The boy knew nothing about his father's occupation because, many years ago, his mother decided to keep her son away from his father. Therefore, he and his mother lived separately. But when the woman found out that her lover had been imprisoned, she felt pity for him and started writing letters and sending parcels. And apparently she told her son the truth about his father and took him on a date with her. Then, probably, his father told Roger about the house and the hidden treasure. But either he couldn't remember the exact place, or he was afraid to tell him. So Roger dug around at random. And you didn't know you were walking on such treasures. Now it seems you are rich. Congratulations. The elderly woman transferred her gaze from the warehouse to Charles, as if not believing her eyes or ears. She couldn't understand what she had to do with this money, undoubtedly obtained in an unjust way. What's it got to do with me? It's not mine. Yes, but it was on your property, which your son bought, which means everything on the property is yours too. The house is yours, that bench over there is yours, the shed too. Everything that comes out of the ground, the flowers, the vegetables, and the treasures are yours. But the money is obviously stolen from someone, especially the gold. Maybe the bandit killed someone for it. How can I use such money? Who knows, maybe someone's blood is on it. Mrs. Langham even shuddered imagining it. No, this money is not involved in anything like that, though you can't call it honestly earned. No one has a claim on it. And by the way, that bandit died a couple of months ago. So you think I can take this money and live peacefully, right? But his son, his wife, he could have left everything to them. The elderly teacher kept hesitating. If he had wanted to, he would have left them. But in fact, he wouldn't have thought of his wife and son if the poor woman had not begun to worry about him herself when he was imprisoned. I don't understand you, Mrs. Langham. Instead of rejoicing... You spoke of material difficulties. You were going to sell the house, and now you're ready to give everything away for nothing? Mrs. Langham paused for a moment and thought, this money could have solved the problems that has been bothering her so much. She could have paid for Amanda's operation and given her son's favourite woman a chance to live and raise her daughter in a decent way. Kate would never have to beg for alms again. They could move out of their shabby hut and into a proper house. But what if that money had blood on it? Because if people were killed for it, it wouldn't bring happiness. And by the way, that woman, who did not want to live with a bandit, but did not abandon him, 
convicted, sick and lonely, surely needs it too. My God, how many unhappy people there are in the world. And Roger, it wasn't out of his personal animosity that he did all this mess to her. He just wanted to find his father's treasure. He probably needs money too. All these thoughts did not let Mrs. Langham make up her mind. Well, that's it, said Charles decisively. We have taken out the treasure. Now you know everything. And you are free to do as you please with it. You can give it to this neighbor or to anyone you want. But I don't approve of such altruism. Well, Charles, don't go, the woman said to the police, who were going to go to the car. I didn't have time to tell you the main thing. Charles, I have a daughter-in-law, Amanda, who is very sick. She needs an operation. That's why I wanted to sell the house. She has a daughter. She's eight years old, and they live in a shabby hut. The house is about to collapse, so I can't seem to give up the money. Then you shouldn't. If not for the operation, they could need money for other vital needs. You yourself say they have nowhere to live. After counting the reward for the find, it turned out that there was enough money, not only for the operation, but also for much more. Mrs. Langham went to the bank, put the money in her account, got a bank card, and went to Amanda with it. Both mother and daughter were at home. Kate rushed to meet Mrs. Langham. Oh, you've come. We weren't expecting you. My darling, Mrs. Langham hugged her and then looked at Amanda. I didn't come early, only because the case was very complicated. I was ashamed. I thought I had deceived you, but I was lucky. Here it is, the money. The three of them cried tears of joy when they found out that Amanda would be able to have the operation. But why? Tell me, why are you ready to give me such money? Because I can hardly pay you back quickly, even after having a job, sobbed Amanda. Why? Do you know who he is? Mrs. Langham pointed to a portrait on the nightstand. That's my son, Billy. So it turns out you are my daughter-in-law, and Kate is my granddaughter. Really? Amanda marvelled, and Kate froze with her mouth open, unable to say anything. Yes, it is true. I don't know why he didn't tell me anything about you. He only hinted that perhaps my dream of having grandchildren would soon come true. But nothing concrete. And he died so suddenly. I couldn't get over it for a year. I just suffered. And then I tried to remember all the pieces of our conversations about his love. But I didn't. I wish you'd come to me and tell me everything. Would I have left you? But never mind about it. The main thing is that it was fate itself that brought us together, or Bill himself. After all, I saw Kate that day when I was returning from the cemetery. So I now have not only a mother, but also a grandmother, said the little girl at last. And you won't put me in an orphanage while Mummy is in the hospital, will you? It's not good for you to live in this wreck. My house is much better. It'll be much nicer at my place, offered Mrs. Langham. Wow, I've always wanted to live here with my mum, exclaimed Kate, jumping up and down. Meanwhile, Amanda quietly cried with mixed emotions. Perhaps she was lamenting the life that could have been, had it not been for the tragedy, she could have lived with Billy. Mrs. Langham left alone that day, giving Amanda and Kate time to pack. She also realised it would be difficult for Amanda to get there on her own, so she would have to call a cab. As the elderly woman approached the house, she saw her neighbour again. Roger seemed less cheerful this time. He saw the policeman who had arrived at Mrs. Langham's house that morning and was frightened. He preferred to leave without waiting for unpleasant visits. That's why he didn't see what was going on in her yard. Well, did your protectors come? What's wrong with you? Why did you snitch? Why have I done wrong? He grumbled as she walked by. Roger, you know why you were snooping around in my yard, Mrs. Langham explained wearily. She did not want to talk to him in private, but she decided that he would not do anything on the street. And it wasn't that scary anymore, 
The money was in her bank account, and Amanda could spend them on her operation. Do you know? But how? And, and now what? The guy asked, confused by his neighbor's words. Nothing. The police with special equipment came. They found everything, she said. Found? Oh, no. What am I supposed to do now? He exclaimed, tears welling up in his eyes. He had been really counting on that money. Oh, stop being so desperate. Tell me, what did you need the money for? To drink more, get rowdy, and keep people bothered with your noise? What do you know about me? Only that I've been snooping around, but now you understand why. You probably think everyone is a bandit, a scoundrel, and you're the only good one. But now you're going to pocket other people's money and sit on it. And you don't want to know about the fact that my mother spent her whole life raising me and my two little sisters without a penny to her name. My father only remembered about me before he died. Maybe he wanted to atone for his sin. However, he couldn't even do that. He forgot where he buried his money. I knew that if you found out, we'd get nothing. Roger, calm down, the elderly teacher said, seeing that the guy was getting really hysterical. I'm not going to pocket anything. That's why I'm asking. What do you need to spend the money on? I feel sorry for your mum too. How would she feel if you lost your way too? That's what you're trying to do. Let me give this money to your mum. She'll probably find a better use for it. You're really going to give it to us? The guy couldn't believe his ears. Well, of course. Though, I won't return them all, because I had to help my own family. I took money for my daughter-in-law's operation, and I'll be glad to have good neighbours. Is there enough for the house? I was thinking of buying this house. I'm renting for my mum and sisters. And don't think I'm going to live here and be a bully. I'm not like that. I'm going to live in the city and work there, and my mum doesn't give you any trouble. My sisters are good twins, too. They're thirteen. Well, bring your mum here. I'll give her everything. The next day, Roger's mother arrived. Having received a portion of the money from Mrs. Langham, she cried. Well, I finally waited for help from the man I loved, and not from him, but from you. You could have given nothing. I didn't count on that money. Roger told me that you took part for your daughter-in-law. I hope they help her. And this money, no matter how it was obtained, will still be cleansed by our good deeds. Otherwise, I would not have dared to take it. Apparently, the money became clean, and it did bring benefits as a result. Amanda had surgery at a good clinic and was on the mend quickly. I simply have no right to be sick now. I have to live for you and Kate, she told to Mrs. Langham, who already felt happy. Now she was in touch with her own granddaughter, helping her with homework, reading books and walking with her. The elderly woman remembered the days of her youth and again felt needed. The neighbouring house was indeed bought by Roger's mother, and she soon moved there with her daughters. The family turned out to be wonderful, and Roger himself, coming for the weekend, also behaved perfectly. He helped his family and Mrs. Langham, trying to make amends for the past outrage. And men's help was not superfluous. It was decided to make an annex to the house because now three people lived there, and Mrs. Langham thought that the family could still increase. There were reasons to think so. Amanda, having been discharged from the hospital, came to Mrs. Langham, and soon the chief of the police department became a frequent guest in their house. Yes, at first Charles came by on business, helping with the paperwork and construction. Oh, not for nothing, such attention, smiled his former teacher. No, Amanda, I do not mind. You're young. Just don't go away. Don't leave me. There's enough room for everyone. Isn't that right? And it was really so. Not two years later, Amanda and Charles got married, and soon Kate had a little brother.